Field day. My name is Amir Kraden. I'm uh, the VP R&D of the customers in DriveNet. And prior to that, I, uh, I had the role of the chief architect for three years, having the opportunity to go from the beginning. Um, what we're going to focus on today is uh, DNOS, the DriveNet network operating system, which is essentially how we build a router, how we build a cluster. Um, when we started, we uh, started with putting ourselves uh, with a set of goals or set of objectives that we want to tackle. One is built for any scale. Having the ability to have the same routing, same network over operating system running on a four terabit per second standalone box and to scale out to 100 of terabit single network entity. Designed for operational simplicity. Uh, it was uh, asked before, but from our perspective, once the cluster is provisioned, this acts like a big chassis meaning that it's lifting, not heavy lifting. You connect to your regular CLI, you're connecting to your regular Netcom system, you monitor with SNMP or with gRPC, it acts like the router you know. Um, single software. I don't want to have a different software based on a chassis size. The same set of Docker containers will be deployed to a single box and to a multitude of boxes if we're provisioned in a cluster. And full system architecture. Offer mentioned it. We're coming as a system company, not only as a software company. When we go to our customers, we don't want the network to be a projection of the router, but the router to be a projection of the network. And the kind of simplicity and the kind of things that we bring to the table enables exactly that. So what is DNOS, the driver network operating system? It's much more than just a network operating system. It's a virtualization layer over white boxes and over servers. Eventually, the way we, we look at the problem, it's an orchestration problem. We have compute resources <coughs> like servers, x86 base one, or an x86 processor sitting inside of a white box. This is where a control plane can be ran. This is where data plane, to a certain extent, protocols can be ran. We have the networking resources with the A6 based on Broadcom Jericho 2 family, which expose the services that the chip can give you, the VOQs, the quality of service, all the forwarding mechanism, we virtualize them and we uh, expose them. Also, we expose all the northbound right. interfaces and we'll cover one. them and integration with third party orchestrators and controllers in. like OpenConfig, uh, like uh, PSEP Base One or SDN controllers. So, the software design guidelines that we put in front of ourselves natively distributed NOS. It's not a monolithic software. From the beginning, everything is a Docker container. If I want to have my BGP running on a server, just deploying it there. If I want it running inside of a white box, I deploy it on, on top of the x86 on the white box. There's no software change. It's only a DevOps thing. It's only where I deploy the Docker container. No change to the software. Extensive use of containers stemmed from many reasons. One, ease of deployment. I develop the same way I'm testing, the same way I'm deploying at the field. That's exactly the beauty about Docker containers. I've built a container with routing protocols. I put it in a testing environment. It's going to run on a server, going to run on the white box the exact same way. Optimize resource utilization. If I have an LECP packet I need to generate, it will be generated on the NCP, on the line card. I don't need to overflow my control. Same goes for things like BFD, which will use cheap resources, or NetFlow being monitored at the line card level. Everything was designed to begin with to scale. And a lot of user space code, mainly only user space code. Starting from a VNF, you cannot scale within the kernel. You have to scale within user space code. So what we did was to abstract every element in the cluster, abstract the server and abstract the white box very much the same way. Because if you look at it, both a white box and a server has an x86 uh, uh, chip inside of them. They could have a switching ASIC in the white box case. It could be a Broadcom made uh, one. Uh, in the CPU, this could be a software-based uh, forwarding layer like DPDK. On top of it, we put the platform and board controlling mechanism, how we control the LEDs, the fans, the power supply units, everything. We have our base operating system made out of or based out of our flavor of Linux and the orchestration agent, what allows us to control that box, Docker, and then the Docker containers. The containers are where the application, our application are, is running, bringing this run, <coughs> router functionality um, uh, to these machines. 
And the use of Docker containers is everywhere. As you go up, as you go up and uh, higher in scale, everything is a part of it. Infrastructure, how I do auto discovery of the Docker containers. My data plane is now a Docker container. It needs an auto discovery mechanism to understand where the control plane. If I have a switchover, something like Graceful Restart or BGP NSR, it's finding the right container and reconnecting to it. Management plane. A lot, of the, uh, uh, a lot of the elements we have inside is eventually to give the service provider, to give you as an operator, a simplest operation. You're logging into the cluster, you're getting one SSH session, a CLI, I'll show it later. You're doing uh, interface MTU on a certain bundle commit. You get the same commit experience uh, as you uh, got previously uh, on existing routers. Control plane with all the routing protocol and the data plane. The challenges that we had to face more than the networking part were doing this uh, very large scale routers, very large scale cluster. Things like internal networking. Unlike a chassis in which I have PCB traces to say a link went down, now everything is a networking packet. I need to multiplex these packets alongside BGP packets coming from the line card to the controller, alongside ISIS, alongside things like traces. I need to bring from the line card counters. I need to bring from the line card. Doing these things at scale yeah, is a hard task. Layered and distributed high availability. What happens if a process crashes on a white box? I can't take one big decision. I have to do it locally. I have to restart the process at the line card level, issue in an event, and then decide what to do. If I have a link down event on a white box, I need to take up this packet up all the rest of the line card need to go into a fast reroute mechanism. Control will reconverge later. But doing these things in a distributed environment is a hard task. Large distributed transaction. It's hard even in a big chassis. You're going into the RP, you type in a command, you do commit. Everything should be uh, provisioned to the line card without being service affecting. Doing that with 100 boxes, it's a, it's a much, much harder task. Timing synchronization. Again, unlike a chassis in which I have trails, in which I have lines for clocking, it doesn't exist on a disaggregated model. This should come from a networking perspective, from packet perspective. All of these things were challenges we had to solve. Allocation of model ID. In chassis, you have a physical slot for line card number zero. What are you doing in a disaggregated environment? What is line card number zero? What is line card number one? Probably stemming from the location at the rack. But we had to tackle that, we had to solve that. So from the service provider perspective, this would behave the same. And debugging tools. One of the hardest things in a distributed system, not only for drive nets, but on any distributed system, how do you handle distributed logs? How do you do traces? What happens if you have a problem uh, with route installation on one of the line cards and you need to look at the rib, you need to look at the fib, you need to look, you need to look at the protocol itself? So is all of this done in band, or do you need some type of out of band network? So the way to look at it, when we look at the cluster, is that the cluster, it's not exposed to the customer, but internally the cluster has a data plane, a data backplane, which is the Dune backplane, and it also has an IP backplane for management and control. So how the DriveNet network operating system looks like. Now I'm looking at the NCC, the Network Cloud Controller, our controller function. This function can run on a white box if this is a standalone. It can run on an x86 server if this is a cluster. Usually it's running redundancy, it's running in pairs. If you want to envision it, think of it as the equivalent of an RP on a, Cis on a Cisco or a Juniper router. This is an RP, meaning that this handles all the control and management mechanism of the cluster, i.e. the router. From northbound interfaces, the CLI, you get one command line interface. No matter how many boxes are coming into play here, one command line interface, uh, you look at it as if it was a physical chassis. NetConf, we're supporting NetConf completely. DriveNet started with open config yangs, augmented them, added to them where needed. These are loaded and handled by the device and exposed outside. So NetConf, so you can bring uh, NetConf configuration on the device. SNMP hopefully will be able to kick it out, uh, but we still need to support it. SNMP supported syslog accounting mechanism like TACX, like Radius, uh, RESTful API for automation, and gRPC, or more precisely GNMI, 
open config GNMI also stemming from the Yang. Instead of getting uh, uh, performance measurement counters out of the router in the format of SNMP or NetConf, which just doesn't scale, you subscribe to a GNMI session with the router. Now you can control the rate of each and every counter. It becomes much more scalable and uh, uh, an easier form of getting out uh, performance management out of a router at that scale. Going lower, the configuration engine is where we load our Yang file, is where we stored the router config. Very similar to uh, what you're familiar with, you're logging into the device, you're working on your candidate configuration until the point in which you hit commit and the entire cluster is being provisioned. That candidate configuration will eventually become the running configuration of the router. The cluster manager, one of the most important part in the driver's architecture, controlling each and every element. Does this box doing the right thing? Do I need to issue a fast reroute? Do I need to do some fail-safe mechanism on one of the white box? Does the software, does the software on the specific white box answer or doesn't answer uh, a health check mechanism? And if not, can I reset it using an IPMI command? All of these uh, logic are handled by the cluster manager. The operation management, high availability, interfaces, even the task of what is an interface in a distributed system becomes a very large task. I have BGP or ISIS running on a server, but the actual packet is going to come out of a white box on a different box. I somehow need to virtualize this interface between them. So BGP running on a server uh, could send out an hello message or a keep alive message or an advertisement from a box it doesn't reside on. Routing engine with all the routing protocols like ISIS and OSPF and BGP. Um, uh, traffic engineering protocol like RSVP uh, that we're supporting today. BGP link state to expose the topology to SDN controllers. PSAP to enable service provider to control the tunnel. In the future, of course, segment routing as another mechanism for uh, traffic engineering. The RIB in which we store all the routing information based prior to installing it on the line card. The FIB distribution. How do I install so many routes at the right place at the right time? What about order? I need to install the egress forward equivalent class before I install the ingress part. So no black holing uh, will be happening in, uh, uh, inside this process. And there is, to a certain extent, some form of mechanism that need to run on a central place, on a data plane layer. One good example would be I could have a lug bundle spanning on more than one line card. Eventually, I can configure something like min links, in which I want the entire bundle to go down if one member is going down. So if such an event would happen, this would be handled here, and very fast uh, um, will, caught, will be uh, caught and handled. And of course, the hardware abstraction layer, as I mentioned before, the base operating system, and the orchestration of the element. Any question about uh, the, uh, the NCC part, about uh, the controlling part? I'm curious as to whether or not you can partition this. Um, think of a managed service provider that might have this disaggregated uh, software architecture. If you can take like um, the, the router and partition it into two devices. Not I only you thought about that. What, what you touched was exactly one of the elements that offer mention. This is exactly the end game, what we want to do. Because eventually, when you have so many white boxes, could port A function as a core device and port B function as a PE? Of course they can. If you have the control plane running outside on a server, then these elements can run as VMs on the x86 server controlling the same hardware. And this is exactly what we're doing and exactly what we're going to do. We want to separate the physical infrastructure from the logical one. Eventually, even from a service provider perspective, you're going to a maintenance window mainly because you need to upgrade software. You need to upgrade your control plane. So in order to do that, if you have your control plane disaggregated, you can take it down without affecting another service running on the exact same hardware. So the end game for us is exactly that. Uh, I have a question on that slide, if I may. Um, I see you guys have dotted Docker across a lot of these slides. Uh, what are you using for orchestration, Docker Swarm? Or are you guys using something homegrown? We're using something 
homegrown, the way to look at it is having a kind of a swarm on each and every element, but we don't have like an entire Kubernetes pod or Docker swarm or every, uh, on the entire element. The reason is uh, um, essentially the scalability of them and how fast they can react to failures. So in routers, you want to react to failures in under 50 millisecond type of scenarios. So when a Docker container full, it's our internal orchestration mechanism that will take in, that will take in charge and we'll put it back up. <laughs> Looking at the white boxes, very similar to exact structure. The white box, the hardware abstraction layer, the basic operating system, and then we're going into the software. The beauty about the way we design the architecture, this is the only place in the architecture which is chip aware. Only here we interface with the Broadcom SDK. It's only here that we translate from the DriveNet language to a Broadcom language. And if tomorrow it will be a different chip, this is where the change would take place. It's not affecting the control and management part, completely abstracted. The board support package coming from the vendor or from the hardware vendor, how we control the fan speed, what do we do with the optics, how do we uh, control the power supply units, controlling the uh, IPMI controller, how do we upgrade firmware. One of the things we do at DriveNet, which is uh, different from other kind of NOS vendor, we take care of the hardware as well. We are the one responsible to upgrade the firmware, all the programmable devices, everything is done by us. Local data path services, things like BFD. If I have a BFD or micro BFD on a certain port, I don't need to overload my controller. I can take care of it at the line card level, at the white box level. Same goes for LACP. For BFD, the case is even, uh, uh, even more interesting than that. BFD for BGP. I can choose one of the line cards and have it allocated to handle the BFD session for that BGP session. We're doing that as well. Why? To scale. When you have to scale, you have to use all your compute and ASIC resources. Um, NetFlow would be another good example. Eventually, a flow in Ethernet will always be hashed to one port, so it's, it's terminating on one line card. Why should I overload my controller? Just export it out of the line card. And that is exactly what we're doing. Always having scale in mind. The fabric box, very similar, exactly same, exact the same, the exactly same software, only configured a little differently, uh, provisioning the Broadcom Ramon chip uh, and creating the network between the chips. Eventually, you get one big end-to-end -end VOQ networking solution. Solution. Any questions? So, if you have a, a network-wide event like a routing reconvergence where you need to have both the local rib fib on the boxes and the control plane sitting in the controller all talk, is there any kind of a performance issue, or no. you haven't had? Yeah. So, the, which I'm sure for, for a provider mm -hmm. environment for that context, that's got to be really nailed down. Yeah, exactly. Great question. As an example, I mean, that's a great question. The solution is quite straightforward. It starts from the beginning. Once you provision the white boxes, you provision more than one path. You have your primary path and you have your alternate path. That, that comes from the, the networking protocol which are already designed to do it. Either directly, things like RSVP, in which you create backup tunnels or segment routing, or from ECMP that reside in the network. You program all the white boxes. Now when you have a link down event, for example, this white box or this NCP shoots out the link down event. This immediately goes to all of the other NCPs. They immediately do a fast reroute. They're waiting for nothing. For them, it's just moving the FIB pointer to the right place on the chip layer. Then routing will reconverge. To do, to do 50, under 50 millisecond type of convergence, you can never wait to your control plane to mm -hmm. converge. It's done, it's done in a very, very structured manner, as exactly, uh, exactly in order to meet uh, such a demand. So that actually doesn't change then? That's exactly. So it does, it's really correct. the same as, okay. All right, interesting, good. So how we are creating a cluster? First of all, it will come from uh, the value-added reseller it, uh, installed at the field. We have our data backplane based on 400 gigi optics, could be active optical cable, real optic, active electrical one, everything depending on uh, the length and on the price you want. So this will be the NCPs, i.e. the equivalent of the line cards. The NCF, the equivalent of the fabric, this is where a data packet will go. It can come through, it can come through this NCP, go out through this NCP using the fabrics. Then we have our management and control part, 
based on uh, the x86 servers connected to each and every device. We create our management and control backplane. It's based on 10 giggy interfaces on the white boxes, 100 giggy interfaces on the servers, more than enough capacity on the server to grow and to handle a lot of management and control traffic. Question on this, what's your geographic ability on this? Do they have to be centrally located mm -hmm. together? Can they be in multiple pops across large Excellent. regions? Excellent question. So the physical limitation today from an NCP to an NCF is uh, 100, uh, it's 100 meter, 200 meter in radius. This stems from the chip delay uh, at the chip layer. The control plane could be farther away. Of course, the logic of how far you put your control uh, from your data plane is just the cause of the delay. So what will happen after this is installed in the FIB and uh, uh, powered up? Everything is internally orchestrated. All of the line card, the fabrics, are calling home to the NCCs, are calling home to the controller. After that's done, we will get a zero-touch provisioning command. Software will come down. This is the first time in which the real Docker containers, the real routing software is coming to the, to the boxes. Software will come down. We internally provision them. From your perspective, from a customer perspective, very similar to what you have today. You take a chassis, you put the RPs, you put the software on the RPs, and then somehow this software gets to all of the line card. We preserve the same operational model for simplicity and for them not to uh, be facing uh, new things to uh, be challenged with. And eventually, after the software is there, it's one network element, one CLI, one big happy router. So how does it look like? If you log into a CLI, this is what we call a small cluster, a 16 terabit per second router. Uh, this one was uh, built with two NCCs, two controllers, one fabric, two line card, and two management switches. I've logged in, I've issued a command called show system in the DriveNet CLI. And what we're seeing, we're seeing a fully functional router. We're seeing the element shown as if this was a chassis with the line card, with the element. What is the operational uh, status of each and every element? We can see the NCC is active up. This is the master now, the active controller. We have standby up ready for events like failover in order to take control uh, of the routing and management protocol. And we have the NCPs, the line card up. This is Two NCP, we can add extra two here and grow uh, and just uh, uh, grow as you need. This is interface management, the same cluster, show interfaces very similar to what you know from a chassis. It, never, it doesn't matter how many white boxes are in the game here. From your perspective, you see each and every interface uh, connected. You can control each and every interface. This is a 100 gig interface residing on NCP number zero, line card number zero, port number 22. Very similar to what you have today, very convenient for the operator to cope with. Another example is the backplane. We have a fabric backplane. I want to expose to the service provider what is happening there as well. A function like show backplane will show you which 400 gig optic is connected where in the backplane, and even if it's connected by design or not. What was your design template, how it was actually designed, and the connection status okay? Aiding the, the, aiding the debug and the ramping up of the cluster at the field. Is this something you've developed, or is this using something like LLDP? Is this is an yeah, excellent question. So it's, everything is something we developed, but in order to do such a thing, we're using both reachability cells at the Dune layer and LLDP cells on the management plane. Okay. So the beauty about engineering is exactly taking sometime existing thing, but kind of mix them in a different way in order to achieve something like that. So to summarize, being the best in class, uh, enabling architecture uh, for service growth and orchestration, the router architecture here is completely reinvented. When he started it, and I needed to go and look on how iOS XR is built or Juniper Junos is built, the solution wasn't there. The solution came from web scale architecture, from how cloud is being designed. Distributed software, 
that enables resource optimization and simplification. From the service provider perspective, this behaves like the router he knows, just built completely differently. It's all about the cluster. Thank you. Question on this. So I understand you guys are having success selling into some existing networks now. Are you primarily focusing on the greenfield expansion opportunities, or are you looking to replace gear already? And what kind of reception are you getting on that? We're doing both. We're okay. doing both. Uh, with customer, we have scenarios in which we're replacing existing equipment, meaning that the uh, share of interoperability tests that we need to be under is very large. On other uh, customers, we're doing kind of a field, uh, new uh, greenfield introduction as part of their white box strategy, meaning that they've decided to uh, operate a new core network, not only with white boxes coming from DriveNet, but for other elements, other technology they want to push at the transport layer or the switching layer. OK, thank you. So I see that you've shown us a command line, and, and this is a very different model from traditional networking. Is there, do you see pushback from, from network engineers who may not be familiar with Docker and microservices mm -hmm. and not knowing how to understand that? And Excellent. so is there a large learning curve, or is that completely abstract, abstracted where they don't need to understand that and for troubleshooting purposes? First of all, it's an excellent question. Um, so we do both. On one end, it's completely abstracted. You go to the CLI, you see all the elements, look and feel very similar to what you know. But for the other element, we are not hiding the fact there are Docker containers here, because it can be, bring you benefit. If you want to upgrade a certain Docker container, go and do it. If you want to reset a certain Docker container, unlike resetting, resetting a traditional entire device, go and do it. So we do both. So you have the option of both. Yeah. Um, having more of that abstraction and automation there, but if you really want to get into the nitty gritty, you can do that. Correct. There isn't like a the learning, either or. Correct. The learning curve for someone who knows how to operate a chassis today to go into this is very minor. I'm um, wondering if you're running the uh, edge and core routers on the white box, so have you done any performance tests? Uh, because now you're running very critical network mm -hmm. but, where with high data, you know, throughputs on the white box. So. Correct. And I, the way to answer it, these chipset are the one designed to do it. If we open a chassis today, this chipset will be the exact same one solving the problem yesterday. So using the same chipset, using the best in class Jericho devices, the best in class TCAM, the hardware is there. The hardware is able to do it. We bring in the software to match that and to enable that, but there's no limitation on the hardware layer. Um, uh, sorry. But earlier, there was a, I think, slide from before about the limitation. It talked about the scalability from, I think, 4 to 768. What is, why is the top end at 768? The what, top end is actually limiting it. It's limited because eventually you build a cluster network uh, from the backplane part. So that will always be limited on the number of ports you have at the backplane. We can always scale higher and higher and higher, but we want to build simple boxes. This is what we do. We built, we built two RU boxes with the exact number of ports. If we wanted to scale larger, we can do it. But I don't see currently uh, networking scaling past 250, like even 250 terabit per second. So within the fabric, are you doing any sort of uh, custom uh, encapsulation or anything like that for packet forwarding? It's done, it's, this is done at the chip layer, meaning that on the, in case of using the Broadcom Jericho 2, a packet coming in would be using the Broadcom cell technology over the fabric. And the second question is, um, do you have any sort of a northbound, uh, call it an orchestration tool, to manage not only this cluster, but also the next cluster, no. the next and cluster? It's called an excellent question because we're going to have a session exactly oh. on that on the dinner point. Okay. Um, your MCCs and NCMs, you're limited to two and two, or do they scale out as you start to increase we the can, size of the cluster? We can scale them out. Usually, NCC, uh, the NCM is depending on the number of elements in the cluster, currently two and four. No need for more, of, more than that, even in the largest cluster. NCCs is usually two because service providers are used to two RPs in a chassis. From our perspective, Let's put more machine and have the control plane distribu distributed even on more servers. We, we are able to orchestrate it on more servers, on more VMs, and even to have a greater degree of redundancy than two. Um, 
I have a question. Uh, I think you mentioned that the data forwarding happens at the chip level. Does any forwarding of packets actually go to or through the containers? Only control and management traffic or uh, packets you, pan, you punt to the CPU. So for example, BGP, ISAS packets, SNMP packets, they will all eventually go up and handled by the x86. But also punt packets. You get, for example, NetFlow sampling, so you configure the device to a certain rate of sampling of packets. This mirrored copy will be going to the CPU to be exported outside. And then, so, uh, I don't know if you can, but which CNI do you guys use? And then which overlay do you use? In turn, uh, maybe CNI, if you could explain. Uh, the container networking interface. The container networking interface internally, it's our own form of uh, VXLAN, you can call it. Okay, and so which overlay are you guys are using VXLAN? VXLAN, internally. How many customers do you have? Today, you want to answer? You want to answer? I'll take it. I have a question from uh, Bruno Wolman, who's uh, another uh, Tech Field A guy that's not here today. But he asked if uh, everything exposed is exposed through the APIs, and are those APIs well documented? Yeah. Provided? APIs are well documented. Uh, we have an effort of doing open API to model each and every one of them. The Yang files, the Yang modules on which these APIs are based are uh, exposed to the customers, so yes. What about troubleshooting the, the networking fabric itself? Did you develop any tools to, uh, yeah. to do that sort of thing? Because yeah. I guess it's a very different architecture than Correct. I were. I didn't have the time here, but we have a, an entire set of command under a command I've shown here, BG, uh, show uh, system backplane, to show the optic level at the fabric, the surface level at the fabric. You can go as deep as you want in order to understand what's happening there. 